phone him up as these flipping Zoom calls. And, you know, my daughter's nine. She could never do it. Homeschooling is, you know, I, I do have curriculum. I don't, I don't unschool. We do have curriculum. But I'm, I'm very much, I can see when she's losing her mind. And so I'll go, go jump on the trampoline. We have a swing in our basement. So I go, okay, go down or go down swing if it's the middle of the winter. It's, it's very, very different. It looks very different. And it's, it's a little bit more child-led. And what I find is, is that when they're not being told what to do, they will lean in and listen. I have got pictures of my, my now 22-year-old sitting at his homeschool desk when, the, when Srandi was a baby with her on his shoulders, sound asleep with her little head on his head. And he's typing at his computer and rocking. Well, she is sound asleep. Like, it's a very different world. Homeschooling is not bringing school home. That's the difference. And what pandemic school was bringing school home. And as we all know, it didn't work. And I don't say that teachers were bad because they darn sure were not. They tried their absolute best and they were stressed to the flipping max because they got like, you know, five minutes notice. Okay, and go. So, but, but we need to know, you need to know that this was not homeschooling. Homeschooling is is a way to connect with your child in no other way. It's a way to it's a way to connect with them and beyond. It's a way to to actually lean in and hear them, hear their voice. And people say, "Well, I work full time." Now, yeah, I get it. If your child is older and they can stay home by themselves, you can still homeschool. If if they are are if you work from home, well, maybe you work till one o'clock. You homeschool later, or maybe you homeschool in the evening. But there's a real emphasis around in homeschooling with around, we don't get bogged down by all the little curriculum. So we don't get bogged down by, oh, you must know, you must know what the atom is by this age and you must know this by this age. Mine is very, my husband was taking Serenity to the park the other day and she goes, and he's a mechanic and Serenity said, dad, how does an engine work? So he says, well, sweetheart, it's kind of hard to tell you. So they came home and he drew out a picture. There's school right there. That was in August. So kids will lean in. They want to learn. Kids are naturally curious. But if you say you must sit here and you must do this, you know, um, my ADD boy was just moved out. But when he was home and I was homeschooling Serenity and there was one quest question left on this unit that we were doing. And I'm like, come on. And she was done. Come on, come on, finish it. And Tyson looks at me and goes, mom, is anyone going to die if she does this question tomorrow? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Tomorrow, she finished the question. The next day, she finished the question, no problem. So it's a lot about letting the kid lead a little bit more and not having to be somewhere in front of a, a screen. And I'm not saying that that's always bad. It just can't be all day because no kid will. And we don't want our kids to be in front of a screen, especially young ones, a lot. So that's, that's what homeschooling is in, as opposed to pandemic schooling. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, and I think Elizabeth can talk to this, that, that it, will be, it will look different in the fall. But... I, if you think you can't homeschool, anybody can homeschool. And if anybody thinks that I'm patient, you just don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I love Sally. She's on it. Yeah. No, that, that's great. Thank you for that clarification. And I love how you brought up the curiosity and it's natural mm -hmm. learning. And it's, I love that. And Marissa on our Facebook Live is asking, and maybe this, you could answer this, Elizabeth. What do you think public school is going to look like? <clears throat> Uh, well, the expectation is at this point in time that uh, we will be covering all the curriculum as we normally would. Um, what we're looking at at the moment is what it's going to look like in the actual classroom because we are really focused on the physical distancing and keeping people safe and also keeping them in cohorts. So for example, in a grade one class, as an example, so I have a teacher who wants to keep her group um, together. And she's gonna have 30 little ones rather than separating that into two groups. She wants to keep them all together because they have been away from school almost six months now. So the, the piece for her that in her mind is if I keep them as a cohort and we do recess together and we do lunch in the classroom and we have little breaks throughout the day because that's what I'm going to be responsible for doing is setting that schedule for them, then that should help to keep the, and we can't guarantee that we're going to keep the pandemic out of the classroom, but we're going to keep the odds of it lower. 
And that really is the focus of what we're trying to do in mm -hmm. a regular classroom. Now, having said that, I mean, there are going to be things that we're going to have to tweak every day. Uh, in our school district, we're being given the opportunity uh, next, not next week, but um, the second, third, and fourth, whatever that Tuesday through Friday is, or Wednesday through Friday, we're going to be given an opportunity to do staggered entries. So that's something that we're working on currently, uh, and we're expected to send a letter home to our families within the next two days to indicate to them what that's going to look like. So that could be, we might invite grade one, three, and five one day, or two, four, and six, or we might invite them by um, alphabet like we did when we had parents come to our school to pick up their supplies in March when, when our uh, classes were canceled. So there are those kinds of things we're trying to figure out what we can do with that. Because when we look at um, inviting people into the school, we're trying to balance what parents are capable of doing too. Because if you have somebody at home who's uh, maybe a seventh grader or an eighth grader and they're babysitting the grade one, and I tell them that they have to come in on separate days, that doesn't necessarily work. If I pick it in, or if we decide to go in the direction of uh, alphabet by family, then a family grouping comes in on one day, their kids go to their variety of classes and they're set to go maybe for that one day in that particular week. Because we've been given this little tiny bit of extension in order for us to be able to work through that. Because when everybody comes on September 8th, we're in full swing, getting ready to get started. And it's like, okay, what does that need to look like? So this is all the process of, okay, how can, you know, and the teachers are coming back and we have to have conversation with them and safety protocols and so on. So that's, that's really the bigger piece of, of where we all are at at the moment. Wow, yeah. And what a thing to navigate. And honestly, I just want to commend you and every principal, every teacher, every educator, and just say, <laughs> well done. You know what? The worst thing that could happen is we try something and it doesn't work. I mean, and that's kind of the way we have to approach this right now. We have to lean in and be okay with, oh, that didn't work. I mean, nobody's led through this. And I think that grace no. is something we're going to have to use right now. Um, I want to remind every parent in, in the webinar and on Facebook Live, please post your questions. Um, I'm going to go right into um, Aisha's question here for you, Elizabeth. But Sally, there's a question just above from Melka. I want you to read it um, and just start to ponder some of the questions she has there because uh, uh, it's, there's some good questions there. But on the same kind of line, um, Aisha mentions, um, in these cohorts, where children will children be permitted to be closer than two meters? And what does recess and gym look like? <clears throat> that question's for me, I bet. That's <laughs> for you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we're still working through all that. We're trying to do uh, the, and, and when I answer these questions, I'm trying to provide you what I imagine it's going to be like in most of our schools. Now, I'm not responsible for public schools. I happen to work in, in the Catholic school district. So just so you know, this could happen in different schools. So parents out there, you need to um, don't go to your school and say, well, I heard this principal say this. These are options that are available and these are things that we're still trying to work through. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to uh, keep students in their cohort. So let's say by particular grade as best as we can. I know that we have some teachers who might teach phys ed in a variety of grades that's one person going into that cohort as opposed to mixing classes. So then, so that's something that we're trying to do as best as we can. It's not always possible because sometimes when we have large groups, we like to, we like to put them together and maybe have, you know, two grade fours have a phys ed class at the same time with one, one te uh, with two teachers in there and, you know, helping to support each other. We're not gonna be able to do those kinds of things because we really are focused on physical distancing. The, the piece that we're going to have to look at is, okay, how is it going to work if we have equipment that we're using? So if we're going to do a, a soccer unit, or if we're going to do a basketball unit, or we're gonna do whatever, 
can we do those things? And that's still stuff that we're working through. We figure that it's possible for us to at least start the fall with, you know, cross country and outdoor types of activities, being able at the same time to focus on the sanitation of the equipment that we're using, right? Um, so that's, that's all in the process. But we're, I'm looking mostly at if we have someone who's a music teacher, if we have someone who's a phys ed teacher, if we have someone who's the specialist sort of in any of those areas, then it's easier for us to do the physical distancing and the mask coming into a classroom <clears throat> and going to the classroom and going to the area rather than coming to the library to sit with the, the uh, librarian. We're going to ask the librarian to go to the classrooms so that we're keeping in those cohorts as best as we can. I'm hoping that answers the question because I can't see the questions, Connie, so you'll have to read them to me. Thanks. Oh, absolutely. Yes. No, don't worry. I got you guys. Well, and, and thank you, Elizabeth. And, and honestly, this is the uncertain part. Yep. This is, and, and as parents, you know, we don't, nobody likes uncertainty. Nobody likes it. 2020 has already been uncertain enough. Nobody's, nobody's <laughs> liking this. Um, but here, you know, here, the, the principals, the teachers, they're trying to figure it out. And you know what? We, who knows until those kids come in. And so, no, thank you, Elizabeth. And, and I do hope that that answers the question. I thought you answered it brilliantly. I mean, sounds like a good plan. I mean, you're doing what you can do. And I think that that's a, a powerful person does what they can. So way to go. Um, Sally, um, Malka's question here. I, I love this, Malka. I understand <laughs> what you're saying here. My youngest son needs people. And yeah. it's been a long six months for him. Um, I love uh, your idea here of small group peer tutoring, um, oh. integrating learning into other activities like a book club, something creative. Um, Pamela on the Facebook Live mentioned, could we start utilizing artists more um, to, to take the um, enrichment side of school? And even if you're going to public school or Catholic school or school in general, you know, the enrichment programs, they may or may not be there. And I think that this is a huge opportunity. What are some of your thoughts, Sally? I have many thoughts on this and we, we, we've, we've been doing this for years. So, so we, and, and when this whole pandemic thing, my kids were in this, this organization called History Alive, which was freaking amazing. And she loved it. And we did, we had a weekly gym class and we, now are, we just found out our gym class is not going to run so far. History Alive is going to run. Um, but here's the thing, here's the thing about it is we have families. I have three families that we cohort with. We did, we, and so we would get together and, you know, we, yes, we physical distanced when, um, now it's summer, they're, they're, they're doing their thing, but we even went into their houses because, and so what we decided to do is like, like is we're going to get together probably once a week. I used to do this thing with the boys before there was a pandemic. Um, and we would have a board game day or we would have, we would do experiments, science experiments. We had, we, their favorite was thrift store day. I mean, that's maybe not as easy to do now, but they would all, everyone would get five bucks and we'd all go to every thrift store and see who got the best value for five bucks. And then they'd win a prize. My boys still love thrifting. I might add. Um, so there's, there's so many things you can do. Um, Serenity has been doing, um, actually zoom call, um, piano lessons with Braden Lister, who you know, Connie, <laughs> and he is amazing. Braden. <laughs> Braden is amazing and he lives in Calgary and he, you know, he is absolutely amazing and she just loves it. Um, there's so many things that you can do. There's, there's, I mean, I, I love what, is it, is it, what was her name? Melka? Is that what her name was? I don't have Melka. it still up here. Melka. Yes. yes. There's, it's, it's absolutely possible. We're going to do um, science stuff with, with the, my cohort groups. We're going to do, so there's two other families that we're going to get together and we're going to do science stuff and we're going to have, we're going to do different sort of things. And the kids, so the kids get the interaction or they might just play, they might just play. Um, you, and there's lots of people needing that and requiring that and wanting that. Homeschooling is not this solitary, oh, I never see anybody and my kid becomes, that's just not, that's, that's a misnomer. Um, your kids really need you, but they also, you can have lots of friends. And if you get on the, there's homeschool groups everywhere online in your, in your community and say, hey, I live in 
Canyon, whatever neighborhood in Calgary, because I'm Edmonton, so I, don't, I can't remember the names anymore. Um, I live that, and anybody, any homeschoolers here, and you can form home cohort groups. And we've already set this up. So because our gym class is not going to run, I have another friend whose daughter is a is a lifeguard, and she's a homeschooler. So she's going to take serenity swimming once a week as long as the pools stay open. Um, so there's there's a ton of things you can do, and I love that idea and we had already we've already set this up and i know that lots of homeschooling moms are and and the other thing that people need to remember is you don't your child does not have to be with the same age that's a misnomer and that's a school thing so when Sreddy was one we used to these families we used to get together with we would go and we, one day we went to play field hockey and she was one year old and the kids are all playing field hockey and she was i hockey too mama she was two actually i hockey too and i'm like oh god and there's these big boys like there were 16 year old boys but homeschool kids are so bizarre they're used to being around younger kids because they usually come from big families so she's out there with a hockey stick that's twice the length of her torso and you see these boys going brady baby mark baby so say in other words get out of the way you're, you're about to back into a baby like they just brought her along that's you, you don't have to be and i think it's really important for kids to hang out with other kids at different ages and to have compassion that a two-year-old wants to play hockey even though it's a pain in the butt right um you learn to adjust so there's cohort groups are a beautiful thing and i have a lots of resources and lots of people like Braden lister being one of them um so people can reach out to me you know, on Facebook if they want. And I, because there's lots of ideas, there's tons of stuff going on right now and people are really requiring that. So. Yeah. I think that, uh, Malka, you brought up a great point. Yeah, Sally, it's great. Like you, like what you're saying here is so crucial. Malka, you brought up a book. Um, I love Ken Robinson. Schools. Have either of so you panelists read that book? I have not, but I love Ken Robinson. I've watched yes. many YouTubes with him, but I haven't read that book. Because <laughs> he did a TED Talk on this. Have either of you watched that? Maybe you could give us some background on what his philosophy is. No? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, his philosophy is about being creative. I have not read that book either. Okay. Um, but I did, I saw him about two or three years ago. And, you know, I'm right there with him saying that we yes. need to, we need to create a different space and place um, for our kids to learn and for us to learn too, to, you yes. know, step out of the box that we uh, typically know as education and, and have some creative ideas. I think teachers are working more in that area, particularly in schools. I think the unfortunate thing that's happening right now with COVID <clears throat> and teachers have mentioned it to me when we were working together with them in May and June and they were, you know, doing preparing again for now. And they were saying, you know, we're going backwards, having to have desks in rows and social distancing and I'm standing in front of the classroom, you know, teaching that way because that's not their style anymore. And it's been so wonderful to see them be creative and come up with, you know, small group activities and centers. And even in our junior high classes, we have some of that going on as well. So that's more in keeping with the, the focus and the format that he has is to break out of the norm and find some new and exciting things to do. Like Sally's just mentioned with, you know, meeting with kids in different grades and or different ages and participating in activities and moving kids along. That's, that's more the focus. This has set us back for a little period of time, hopefully to, to reflect and to come up with mm -hmm. some new and exciting things. Because I think our teachers are going to be challenged into that now too. You know, they were challenged when we were asked to, you know, on Friday the 13th, which is an interesting kind of day. You know, there was a full moon that week. Uh, we had just given out our progress reports. Uh, kids are, uh, you know, up and doing things. And all of a sudden now it's, oh, and by the way, there's no school on Monday. Okay. And so our teachers, my philosophy with teachers is to create relationship. That's first and yes. foremost, before <laughs> you get to curriculum. And so we spent a little bit of that time. We had the luxury of, because we were not on spring break. So we had the luxury of being able to connect on Zoom. Although, you know, I get that everybody got Zoomed out, uh, no pun intended. Um, but, um, you know, that was a piece for us to reconnect with kids, to, you know, check in to find out how they're doing. 
bring down that anxiety. And, and that was helpful for the beginning of, of what came to be, you know, something out of control for all of us. I but think it's his, his oh, philosophy is, <laughs> is, uh, is wonderful. Mm. Something I heard <laughs> both of you say is this idea of community, this idea Absolutely. of cohorting. And, and you're both doing it in, in both of your contexts. And I think if you're an educator watching this on Facebook Live, if you're on the webinar, you're a parent, uh, you're an educator, um, I want to remind you that community has never been shut down through this whole thing. Uh, COVID doesn't stop people. Um, COVID um, never stopped the opportunity for people to be creative. And I think sometimes we're so busy being in reactive mode, we're in the back of our brain. And when you're in the back of your brain, you can't be creative. All you're thinking about is the problems. You scroll through Facebook and every single one of your fears is confirmed by someone <laughs> with some kind of background. We don't know what their background is, but we know that they must be right because it's on social media. Um, and, and we just, we get into this reactive mode, but we forget that our biggest resource is not our school system. It's not whether we choose homeschooling or whether we choose to go to school. Our greatest resource is people and connection and nothing can shut that down. Serenity's piano lessons did not stop. She kept going with a, an amazing artist named Brayden. Like, this does not mm -hmm. stop. And I'm, I'm hearing this even through our chat here, this idea of cohorting. And um, Sally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into you for a moment here. But first, I just want to encourage everyone. Um, I am already, myself personally, planning to cohort with people. My, both my boys are going to be going to school but we don't know what's gonna happen. And I'm certainly not here to preach gloom, or gloom, gloom to anybody. I'm not like speaking anything, um, but you know, we don't know that we've heard that there might be a second wave. What if we, things got shut down week two? What if things got shut down at Christmas? Who are you gonna lean on? Who's gonna take care of your kids when you're working? Um, all the problems that we were faced with on that Monday morning, like you mentioned, Elizabeth, all those problems are going to come back again, but this time we have something very powerful. We can be proactive. If you have a cohort, um, you can just stick with those people. You can share childcare. You can share activities that keep kids active. Like the problem solving is, is, is endless. You have creativity when you get with people. So Sally, can you just talk to us a little bit about this idea of cohorting? So the whole idea of cohorting is, okay, you're, you're, you're staying with the same people, so you all know you're, all, you're sharing the same germs, as it were. Now, it doesn't mean we're going in and licking everybody's hands. It just means that we're, we're going to be careful and we're going to social distance. Our big thing is kids outside as much as possible, even if it's a little bit snowy out, but not like minus 40. I live in Edmonton, so that crap happens, and we don't get the schnooks. But the thing about it is, is that, is that the one thing, Sreddy is essentially an only child because my boys have, have now grown and moved out and um they need they need friends they need community they need community they don't they don't need to be all the time but like she knows that once a week we're going to be doing stuff with these other two families and she's and she is she does so well the big thing is, is that and so whatever and we might be doing some we might be doing some guided stuff we probably will. We'll probably be doing some science. Then maybe one's going to do science experience. Not in my house because I'm way too anal for that. That's going to be at Brandy's house because she doesn't care because she has 12 kids. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> but you, you, you pick what you're comfortable with. We're going to do scavenger hunts. We're going to, and then we're going to just take them, let them go hang out at Chicago Lake, which is a lake, a small lake north of us. Like there's, and and we'll they'll be doing bugs and looking at bugs and leaves and all this stuff. And we'll be doing crafts and we'll be doing all those kind of things. The music lessons we do, I was like, oh, okay, I, we have to get out of the thinking that we must have curriculum and we must, must meet the standards. Let it go. Let that crap go. I said to Braden very early on, I said, okay, well, do I need to buy books? What do I need? What do I need? And he says, Sally, does, do you want her to hate music lessons like you did or do you want her to like it? And I'm going, well, I want her to like it. He goes, okay, then shut up and let me do it. I'm like, okay, I've known Braden since he was born, so I, he can talk to me that way. And he said, so he goes and they jam and all I hear is giggling. 
and she has a big time and she plays the piano and she has fun and she loves it. So we need to, kids need to have fun. That's what they need to do. If it becomes a job, if it becomes work, and if they have all these worksheets that you have to print off and they have to do. So cohorting is about learning through play, mm -hmm. learning through community. And I know stuff about baking and that kind of thing, but Brandy's really up on this and Karina's going to be really up on something else. And so it's drawing on the strengths of the other parents too, right? That's the other piece of it. And for people who are in school and say the school does shut down, maybe you cohort and go, okay, I can take the kids Monday, Tuesday, if you can take the kids and you can sort of do the whole going thing. And then another mother takes, I don't know. I mean, that's, those are ideas, right? But be creative about it, but don't be married to curriculum and worksheets. Not that I'm sorry, Elizabeth, don't hate me. I'm just saying <laughs> that there is ways of doing this, but you have to be creative. But you know, we always tell new homeschoolers, you must, you must de-school first. And we need to do that right now, whether you're putting your kid in school or not, you have to de-school. Elizabeth, you can attest to the fact that nothing's normal, nothing's the way. We have to, we have to be creative and you have to think, okay, what can I bring to the table? What can my friend Brandy bring to the table? What can Karina bring to the table? And what do the kids want to do? Yeah. And maybe they just want to play. Yeah, okay. that's good. No, that's so good. And, and I love, like Vanessa has mentioned here in the chat, you know, she has two introverted teens and i mm -hmm. have a very introverted teen in fact mm -hmm. my teenager does not like people in fact yes mine did quarantine too. was the best thing that ever happened to him he's like i didn't have to see people because he <laughs> doesn't like people because people have not been very nice to him but you know right. what i did vanessa is i had one friend for my mm -hmm. introverted son somebody he trusts somebody he actually likes and and you know what we had him over twice a week and mm -hmm. that made all the difference. And for me, I would die. I would die with one person. I need like, I need my people. I'm a tribe person. But him, that was just what he needed. And so don't, when you're listening to this, when you're thinking of cohorting, you don't need 12 people. I think that's one of the, I think we're going to be coming into a season in culture where we're deconstructing what community and connection really looks like. And a lot of us think, oh, that means a mass social media following. And that means like, big gatherings no we're talking micro we're talking mm -hmm. like you and two other families we're talking like simplicity we're moving into a whole new season of of life and and it's it's going to be very very interesting and so um there's a few more questions we're going to try yeah. to get to as many as we can but um elizabeth i have like there's three questions that people have um okay. josephine um, on our, our Facebook Live is saying, in junior high, will the cohorts be by grade or class? Will the additional programs like hockey be offered this fall? And again, you don't know about Ontario and the United States, but from your knowledge at best. Uh, from what we are led to understand at this moment in time from our curriculum in Alberta, and certainly with our particular school district, we will not be able to offer the hockey program. Um, and there are some other shifts that have happened as well. We have uh, a handful of schools in our district who are year round schools. And that has also been put on the back burner for this year because they want to try and, uh, well, because first of all, um, our year round schools would have started August 1st. And nobody was prepared for that because we didn't really, at that point in time, really know what the ministry was going to be up to in terms of the direction that they wanted to set. So those bigger programs on, at the moment are on hold. And I think the hockey program might very well be on hold for the year. But don't quote me on that, but that's what I'm guessing at this point in time. Because it's going to be challenging enough for us to be able to set the stage for our regular classes. Um, ask me the second part of that question, please. Uh, well, actually, it's a different one now. Um, Tad oh. is asking, how do you see it working for kids at school when they'll have to quarantine with any symptoms? I'm worried about them missing and getting behind. Yeah, and that's still in, that's a work in progress as well. Uh, our, and I saw a question quickly zip in terms of curriculum too, so I'll answer that one as well. Um, <clears throat> we've just been uh, given our protocol for 
how it's going to be expected for us to work through things as, um, you know, if, if someone is tested positive. Um, so there are a couple of things that we're working through at the moment. So in terms of uh, if it happens to be in a family, the recommended, and I'm not saying that this is going to be actual for every, because we're going to do stuff case by case. That's really how we're going to do the bottom line here. As best as we can, we'll take every case as it comes along rather than just a blanket thing. This is what happens. So if there happens to be a positive in a particular family, the suggestion that we're going to work with at the moment is that that child or children in that family stay at home. And somehow we're going to create what that needs to look like in order to help support that family. And I get that there's a what if for anything, right? Those questions can, we can lose sleep forever trying to figure out all the answers. So we have to be able to have that conversation with families too and say, okay, how can we best help support you? Uh, we have a direction obviously with the curriculum. It's an expectation that, you know, curriculum is taught. And uh, unlike what we did with um, <laughs> um, pandemic learning, uh, this is really a focus more on how best can we come to a somewhat normal place. Is that helpful? I think that was helpful. I mean, like you're right, it's, it's very unknown. And, but uh, no, thank you, Elizabeth. And, and just to answer the, the curriculum question, I did post uh, a link to the government. Uh, they always, yes. the government of Alberta always has Every, you want to know what your kids are studying? Just go on that website that I just posted in the chat and, and you'll find out like, oh, grade four, they're going to learn, grade three, they're going to learn about bridges. How fun is that? Um, but Sally, can you tell us like from a homeschool perspective, like how do you know what you're supposed to teach every year? So like we also have teachers that are what we call facilitators. So when you sign up with the board, you have to sign up with the board. And we have teachers who are facilitators. Now we don't, I don't, sorry, Elizabeth, cover your ears. I don't okay. care what the government wants my kid to learn. I don't actually care. I want them to be able to read. I want them to love reading. I want them to be able to learn. I want them to be able to write. I want them to be interested and curious about the world. And, but there's many different, um, there's many different um, curriculums out there and so much of it and if anybody wants to just reach out to me I can, but there's many different curriculums for how your kid learns because what worked for Brady did not work for Tyson and what works for Tyson and Brady didn't work for Serenity at all even a little bit and the beautiful part about homeschooling is that we can pick our curriculum now lots of them are aligned um, I don't personally care but lots of people do and that's fine I mean just a personal choice thing but the ones I'm using are probably probably mostly aligned with Alberta curriculum, but she's also in grade three. Um, but I don't, I don't worry too much about what the government wants as far as until they get into like high school. Um, so I just want her to love learning. I want her to be able to learn. I don't want her to shut down. So we found a beautiful program um, uh, that I love and she loves and it works, but I don't get married to it either because sometimes it's like, mm, yeah, you know what? She knows that. So we'll move on. Or she's just not, we're going to slow down because that's getting too much for her. She's a kid from hard places. So we have a different you know, situation, right? But, um, there's lots of curriculums and sometimes kids are visual learners some kind like there's a Saxon that is like totally worksheets and my kids want to blow their heads off they did it for about two weeks and went mom I'm gonna kill myself okay all right we're not doing that then but I don't have friends that they love that curriculum kids like some kids like to do that my kids wanted to kill themselves and so it just you 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 got to know your kid and you got to and, and I'm very not married to a curriculum that if my kid goes I hate this and I never want to do this again okay I was forced to read Shane in grade nine, a stupid book that I still am bitter about at 55 years old. And I made a vow that my kids will never freaking read a book that they don't want to read because I'm still bitter about Shane. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I always love what you say about like, you know, bringing the joy back. I have two boys and my boys, um, do not like just learning because of that. And so, no, that's, it's, the idea of, of creating creativity and curiosity and the love for learning. I mean, I love learning, yeah. you know, so no, I love that. You know, um, it's, it's very interesting, all of this. Um, 
I've noticed some themes coming up through what we've been talking about here. And I hope that everyone feels encouraged. If you still have questions and, and maybe something comes up, you know, consider us a resource for you. Um, I, I mentioned this before, community solves every problem. I actually want to challenge every single person on the Facebook Live and on this webinar. I want, to I want you to think of one problem, one problem in our world that community can't solve. And if you can answer that, then I'm going to send you something. I'm going to send you a Starbucks card or my book or something because you deserve a prize. <laughs> I literally, this is, this is my line of work. This is my, curi this is my natural curiosity. This is what I love. Community solves every flipping problem out there. And so I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you that the problem is not what school to choose. The problem is not the government. The problem is not the healthcare system. It's not the school board. It's not even COVID. You know what the problem is? Is that the parents are feeling ill-equipped. They don't know how to do, deal with the uncertainty. They don't know how to do a new frontier. And they're doing this alone. And the lack of village is affecting all of us. No one does well alone. Our kids suffer, we suffer, we have been parenting alone for too long. It takes a village, but there's no villages. And I wanna read you something. I wanna read you something I read on the internet. This is so powerful. Dear parents, this injustice is affecting everyone, men, women, children alike. Mothers feel it, but it's everyone. The injustice is this, it takes a village, but there are no villages. And by village, I don't mean a group of houses. I'm referring to the way of life, that small community where individuals know each other, share joys, burdens, sorrows of every day. They nurture one another in times of need. They, they mind the well-being of each other they're, and their ever-roaming children and their increasingly dependent elderly. I'm talking about the most natural environment for children to grow up. I'm talking about a way of life that we're wired for. And then they, they talk about the absence of the village. Who would not love that? Who would not love a village to surround you? If that's you, say yes. Say yes. I'm like, yeah, I, I feel like I'm tired of doing this alone. This is what she says that the absence of the village creates an enormous pressure on parents. Anyone? Does anyone feel that? Do you feel the enormous pressure of trying to trudge this alone? Our priorities, they become distorted and unclear. We feel less safe and more anxious. And we're forced to create tribes and out of nothing, we, out of air. Like you go to your neighbor and they look at you like, what are you doing knocking on my door? Who does that? We tend to hold on tight to our ideals. And, and we run around like crazy and we forget what normal feels like. Depression and anxiety skyrocket. Who has depression and anxiety in their homes? We feel disempowered. We spend money that we don't have because we're trying to entertain our children. We're relying too much on social media. We feel lonely and unseen. Our partnerships are burdened. We frequently feel judged and we feel guilty for pretty much everything. Oh my goodness. Does anyone feel that? Is anyone else with me on that? You feel that whole, um, that whole pressure of not having a village. Anyone? Are you feeling this? I'm just curious. We have some questions here. Um, yes, wonderful. No, that's good. Me too. Me too. It takes a village, but there's no villagers. Well, what if you had a village? What if you had access to supportive parents journeying with you, being that cohort, being that community? What if you had coaches like Sally? Sally is a connection coach. She's also um, someone who coaches people with homeschooling. She's mentioned a couple of times reach out to her. Well, guess what? We have, a, we have a village where you have access to her all the time. A health coach. What if we had people who could help you be healthy as a family? School support like Elizabeth. What if you had access to Elizabeth anytime you needed? You just message her. Well, we have that. A counselor. I'll tell you something. When we went through our mental health crisis with our son, um, counseling, everybody said, oh, there's so many, there's so many resources that are accessible and, and for every, you know, when you're going through these things and I would get to find them. I'd go to search for them, couldn't find them. And when I did find them, there was barrier after barrier. What if you could get counseling when you need it just like that? You know, that's, that's what we need as a village. Well, we have 
that kind of village. We've created it. Everything that I saw that was wrong, <laughs> I thought, I'm one of those people that I'm like, I'm not waiting for the government. And I'm not waiting for the school. And I'm not waiting for anyone else to create this. I'm going to do it. And Sally said, yeah. And Elizabeth said, yeah. And what we did was we created something called the Brave Parent Institute, which is basically a membership program. And guys, I want to be really careful here. I'm not here to sell you on what we're doing. I'm here to say that if you have questions about any of this stuff, if you've been struggling, if anything that you're like, yeah, that's me. I just want to let you know that you don't have to do this alone. If you're doing it alone, it's, it's ill. You, you don't need to. Uh, the first thing I thought was when we were going through a lot of the things, we were homeschooling. I didn't have a guide. Trying to find a school for my 13-year-old son is like near impossible. Elizabeth has helped me so much because nothing works for my son. I don't even know if this year is going to work for him. But I have Elizabeth. I have a tribe of people that I'm leaning on. And one thing I realized is that there's nothing affordable out there. If I wanted help, I'd have to pay a pretty penny or I needed to wait for two years. And I'm not, I can't wait for two years. And so basically we created something. You can see it right here. If you want some information, I can definitely send this to you. But basically, you know, we, we do a membership that's very basic. You get access to a, a private Facebook group for 24 seven support. You post in there anytime. And these coaches, they come in there. We give meal plans and workouts. Like that's like having a gym membership. Weekly group times where we meet on Zoom. And honestly, it's been the most amazing experience. And, and I've got some parents that have given me some testimonials. I haven't put them together yet, but I am un, I'm blown away. Because the reason why I created this is because people are crying out for this. They're, they're like, I don't know who to turn to. I don't know how to reach out to, to, for help when I need it. And one of the things I realized is that Canada right now is number 25 in the world for child safety. And that number shocked me. I thought for sure we'd at least be top 10, but we're not even top 10. This is from a study called Raising Canada, Canada out of the University of Calgary. Um, Children's First. If you want to follow them on Instagram, you should. Children's First, they do amazing work. Sarah Austin, shout outs to her. But I have to say, when I saw that number, you know what I realized is I realized that there's too much brokenness that goes on behind closed doors that nobody is talking about. And I know because when we were going through uh, knife threats from my son, rages, who do I tell? That's not good grocery store lineup uh, conversation. <laughs> who do you talk to? You get judged. And so we, I realized that the need for safe community was really needed. And people don't know how to create that. Well, here we are. Um, you can see the rest, but basically this is our mantra. This is kind of what we're all leaning into. Coaches, counselor, all, all the parents, is this idea that we're brave. We show up when it's hard. We love without walls. We forgive when it hurts and we rise through the storm. And what we're doing is we're coming together to learn. What does it look like to parent? What does it look like to parent through COVID? What does it look like to figure out what school looks like? You don't have to do this alone anymore. In fact, if you do this alone, I, the resilience just goes right down. The studies are there. Resilience happens. Bravery happens in community. And there's no other way. You try to do it on your own, you're going to drown. And, and honestly, it's just so important that right now in this new era, if I, if I could call it that, Community is going to be the answer for everything. You can't rely on the government. I'm not saying they're not doing a good job. I'm not saying they're doing a bad job. I'm just saying stop waiting for the flipping government to solve your problems. Come together right now. Anyways, <laughs> so if you want to reach out to us, um, this is my email. You can send me all your complaints. <laughs> you can send me all your comments and questions. This is our Instagram, Brave Parent Institute. This is how you can find us online. It's on my website, Brave Parent Institute. But it's just so, so important to do this as a community and to not do this alone any longer. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. I, I noticed that Jackie has a question here about um, the Calgary School Board. Well, that'll be interesting because um, Elizabeth is with the Catholic School Board, but maybe Elizabeth, you could just respond to this as best you can. She's asking about if you have any insights around the online learning option, because um, they're trying to decide if they're going to do that or not. 
I know that we have uh, one school that was created over this, this past six months in order to be able to focus on that. So I would suggest if you're looking at the Catholic system, the principal's name is Bernie Varum, uh, and you can reach him through the district. In fact, if you want to uh, send him an email to ask for information, because he would be the best one to be able to support the kinds of questions and concerns that you might have so that he can give you a better um, idea about that. So you would write his name, B-E-R-N-I-E dot Varum, V-A-R-E-M at C-S-S-D dot A-B dot C-A. That's the Calgary Catholic School District. And anybody else that you want to get in touch with through there, that's the same back end of the, the email for everyone. It's the first name dot last name. That's awesome. Thanks so much for that, Sally. And again, like every school board is different. You may be listening yeah. even out of province and every province is different. Um, everywhere is different. And so just reach out. I noticed that uh, Jody here is asking, you know, about her son. Um, you know, her older kids are looking forward to going back, but her youngest son has autism. He's regressed being at home. Yeah. Um, doesn't He doesn't like to leave the house and he's hope, she is hoping to work with the staff of her school for a gradual re-entry plan yep. um, with the goal of getting back to full time. And she's just wondering how realistic she is in her expectation or. Uh, that would be something I would suggest to her. If she was calling me and he, and her child was coming to my school, I would have that very plan in place. Have that conversation with uh, the teacher. If, if that child has been in that school for a couple of years, it might be best to connect with the teacher was it a boy? I'm, it doesn't matter it's boy, whether yeah. it's a boy or a girl. Um, but that it would be best to connect with the teacher that that child had as his last teacher um, so that there's a connection and there's um, hopefully just a little bit lessening of anxiety uh, to have that child come in even next week or the week after if the teachers happen to be in school because I know that uh, the teachers in our district are due back at school next week, uh, next Wednesday. So if there's a, a, an ability even just to come by to the school to say hello, that's going to be a little bit like, oh, thank God there's somebody here that I can connect with. Because children need that opportunity, whether they have a, a special need or not, that those are things, and that's why we're doing the staggered entry as well, because I think that's going to help to reduce some of the anxiety, both for the teachers, the parents, mm -hmm. and the children. <clears throat> you know, yeah. and, and I'm certain that with Sally's connection with her families and with homeschooling in general, even with cohorts, there needs to be that relationship building piece first. The connection mm -hmm. has to happen before anything else goes. Because as you said before, Connie, with the, uh, you know, where we're, we get attached to that reptilian brain, that you know, fight or flight one. And if we're stuck in that space, we don't, we don't have the capacity to be able to see anything else. So if we can move that energy into some place in the front of our brain and into our, our emotional peace mm -hmm. and our confidence and our self-esteem and reducing the anxiety piece, then that's going to make leaps and bounds of being able to connect and work in in a classroom yeah no that's beautiful sally i'm gonna i'm gonna give you a moment just to close us off here about connection but before i pass the mic to you um i want to mention to everyone on our brave parent um facebook and our brave parent institute instagram this summer we have posted basically free coaching for how to connect with your kid for free <laughs> and, and I'm going to be really honest here. We're taking it off in two weeks because we're turning it into an online course. So if you want free uh, material on how do I connect with my kid? I don't even know. I don't even know any of this world. The world we have lived into up till now, um, it hasn't been based on connection. It's been based on performance. It's been based on um, <laughs> show up, suck up. Don't tell me how you're feeling. And that doesn't work. Uh, apparently when crisis hits, those things don't work. So if you want some tools um, that, and you're like, I can't afford to join your village, um, well, that's free. 
and take advantage of it. Because honestly, right now, our goal is to help parents succeed the best we can. And so Sally, why don't you close us off by telling us um, a little bit about why, why connection is so crucial right now in our kids' lives? I think it's in crucial always, but the biggest thing that people do with connection is they overcomplicate it. They, like, oh, your kids don't need Disneyland, they need you. So that could mean sorry, playing the game sorry 87 times a day, which is what I do. It could mean going for a walk, it could mean anything. I always say date your kids. Um, I, I used to take them individually, and I still do. Um, but the don't overcomplicate it. You don't need fancy anything. It, they just want time with you. We play a lot of board games. We sit down at the dinner table. We, if I see a kid, when I had them all three at home and I see one that was not doing well, I'd say, hey, let's go for, let's go for lunch. And, and they're grown now and they still call me and say, mom, I need to go on a date with you. My boys do that to me regular as one did it last week this is what connection does is that you become their go-to you want to be their go-to and the only way to do that is through connection so don't overcomplicate it they don't need disneyland i mean disneyland's great don't get me wrong but i'm just saying they need you wow, and sometimes we have to play we have to do sucky things like play sorry 47 times a day <laughs> yeah we're really building patience who prayed for patience you know <laughs> Don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I want to thank you so much, Sally and Elizabeth. You are both, um, you know, you're just the most stellar leaders. And, and you lean into difficulty with such um, vulnerability and, 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 and creativity. And I really, really appreciate you as my, my team members and my friends. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in. I hope that we've given you um, something, some tools to, to think about, some, some philosophies to chew on about community and doing things differently. And if you ever need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, the webinar does not end. Our relationship with you doesn't have to end here. Um, so please reach out, don't do this alone. And I just wanna wish everyone a really great week. And as you navigate, if you need any further clarification or questions, um, we're here. So anyways, have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys. guys. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.